I'm sure we'll find out. But I said we want you. I'll be right back. Yeah. Really started to very kind. Yeah. Yeah. Very kind. Yeah. Hi, folks. We're gonna get started. I think uh, I like to run on stratum time, which is about six minutes uh, past the hour is when things get started. So I'll 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 pad. I'll fill it in here. Um, happy National Library Week. This is a special National Library Week program that I, uh, I booked uh, several months ago uh, because I didn't want to miss out on our fabulous presenter getting her calendar filled up. Uh, so I grabbed her as soon as I could. Um, that's, my, that's my attendance sheet. Just maybe a straggler or two comes in. Um, Jay O'Neill is uh, something of a legend on Zoom these days <laughs> since, since COVID times. She has been working through the humanities, um, New, uh, New Hampshire Humanities, uh, and offering all these great programs and um, uh, has built quite a cult following. <laughs> she comes to us from, well, you're, you're still, are you still teaching? A little bit. Yeah. So in her bio, it is very impressive. She holds a uh, art history major, uh, master's from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard. And she's worked with the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen and uh, the Courier Museum. And uh, this particular program, have you done this one yet? Yeah, <laughs> it's a new one though, right? It's a new, the library architecture? I, I've only given it a few times. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we're, we're very, uh, very honored to have that uh, have you do that for us, and um, thanks to Exeter TV for coming along and recording it for those of us who can't be here tonight. Uh, I haven't stalled long enough. <laughs> That's okay. You can go ahead um, and take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about library architecture, and um, I just really appreciate you being here and to to meet some people that I've only known through Zoom is such a treat. So thank you again for being here. Tonight, we're going to be looking at library architecture um, with this notion that we should not be judging libraries by their buildings, uh, because we all know that great things are happening inside, no matter what the exterior looks like. So tonight, we're going to be getting a little bit of history, and we're going to be looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly. And since we're sort of an intimate group, maybe we can weigh in on our opinions uh, uh, on a few works here. So uh, this is the Kansas City Public Library in Missouri. This actually isn't even the library building. This is the parking garage. It's like a little oh. screen. And this is called the Community Bookshelf. This uh, dates back to 2004. They invited the community to contribute their ideas for which books should be featured there. It's actually much bigger than what you see, but we'll see it featured in the program too. So let me give you a sense. I, I want to... Um, I want to get a little bit of library credibility to start off here because one of my very first jobs as a teenager was working at my local library, the, the Carpenter Memorial Library in Manchester, New Hampshire. We've got an exterior view and an interior view here. I was the page, so I was going down into the stacks. I felt like I knew that library so well. And I loved the work that we were doing as a library. Now, this sort of continued on when I went to college and when I went to grad school, because even though I was studying art history, I was working in slide libraries with those old fashioned slide carousels. And I really credit this experience as part of, you know, my it, it, it sort of formed me as a professional because now I'm so interested in the sequence in the, of images. But of course, Slide libraries don't even exist anymore. If you Google the term slide library, this is actually what comes up, a slide in a library. <laughs> That's in a private home, by the way. <laughs> so um, shortly after I graduated from college, I was living in Boston, and I went on a tour of the Boston Public Library, an art and architecture tour. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend it. It's life changing. And for me, it inspired me to apply for a job at the Boston Public Library. So you have, you know, this barrel vaulted ceiling in the in the reading room here. So inspiring, so beautiful. And then all of the major artists of the day were invited to go into this library and paint murals. This is the Abbey Room painted by Edwin Austin Abbey. It's, you know, this great sort of medieval fantasy. And then you have that grand stairwell at the Boston Public Library, which just knocks your socks off. It's this yellow sienna marble. And you have, you know, the 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 lions that are there as like the protectors, because of course libraries 
housed and have always housed treasures. But but I mean, we'll see through the course of the evening that that books were one of the most valuable things you could own. So why not protect it like it's a, a citadel here? But it's such an exquisite space. And one of the things that really moved me was that the, the original concept for this library was that it was to be a palace for the people. And I thought that is just so downright inspiring. Now, if you've ever been there, you probably remember that you're supposed to rub the back of the lion's tails for good luck. And I also really loved that too. So when I was applying to grad school, let me tell you, I was rubbing those tails all the time. <laughs> so the end of that tour that so inspired me, we, we end on the steps uh, looking out to Copley Square. And the tour guide turns us back around and points out that right over the door in stone, it says free to all. And I'm getting so moved. I feel like, you know, we are at this temple to democracy. We, you know, we value an informed citizenry. It all begins here with, with you know, these words written in stone. And I will not lie, I, I shed a tear that day. So like I said, I applied for a job. I ended up working at the Boston Public Library Foundation, which I think is now uh, the fund. It has a slightly different mission. But while I was working there, one of the things we did was raise money for the restoration of all of those incredible murals. I was not one of those people working on them, though. I was just raising the money. So that's the John Singer Sargent mural, of course. So over the years, I moved from libraries to museums here. And um, I must admit that libraries continue to hold this special place in my heart. They were the temples to democracy that, let me tell you, museums, art museums, imagined that they could be. And of course, libraries are free and open to all. And then museums have these ever increasing admission prices. They're sort of seen as cold and elitist. And so there was always, a, you know, this this desire deep down in me that, that I was still in, involved with libraries. And so I began to really think about this connection between libraries and art museums over the years. And you know I'm from Manchester, New Hampshire. I always was sort of tickled by the fact that in Manchester, it was the same architectural firm that designed the library and the art museum there. So I began to think of you know this kind of similar function that they have in our society, uh, that they're both designed to look at like these temples that are meant in some ways to kind of elevate and civilize the masses. Now, if we're thinking about museum architecture in general, uh, well, I, actually, let me back up for a moment. Library building booms and museum building booms sort of happened at the same time, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. But if we think about museum architecture in particular, we're looking at the Philadelphia Museum of Art here with the famous Rocky Balboa steps, right? You get up to the top and you have to celebrate that you made it up there. Um, we have this notion of a pretty antiquated design, especially when it comes to uh, art museum architecture, because there's this there's this sense of, of lack of accessibility when you look at something like this physically and sometimes intellectually. So needless to say, if somebody was going to design their perfect community space here, whether it's a museum or a library, they probably wouldn't start with this model. So in um, in the years before Zoom, <laughs> I was actually going out to a lot of libraries and I had this experience that reminded me so much of the challenge of art museums on a small scale because I went to a lot of little muse little libraries that looked like this and I would jog halfway up the steps on stratum time. So I was usually about 10 minutes later than I was supposed to be. And I'd get halfway up the steps and then I'd see a sign on the door that says, go around to the back of the building, you know, and you're like, oh darn. So it's it's this notion that the, the library building boom really happened when cars weren't necessarily a ubiquitous part of American life. So all of these libraries have since had an addition and a parking lot put on, on the back and that front door is now inaccessible, right? I can't tell you how many libraries I've been to where you can't even walk through the front door. So this is a very similar challenge to what museums see. So I, I just want to end with, with the fact that, that well, and the preamble <laughs> that is, with the idea that in so many towns, the library is the intellectual and the cultural heart of the community. And that's reflected in a downtown setting that's reflected by prestigious architecture. In this case, we're looking at the Pollard Public Library in Lowell. And then this is, of course, the Thomas Crane Memorial Library in Quincy. And even though they're gorgeous, even though we might be like, you know, <laughs> drooling looking at these uh, envious, 
we have to consider, are they welcoming? Um, is, is it accessible? Does uh, library architecture as a cousin to museum architecture perform its most essential function uh, beyond housing books and resources? Is it welcoming to the public? So we're gonna dive into all of this. This is, that was an extended overview, but let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through the material tonight. We're going to get started with a brief history of library architecture. I'll make it as exciting as possible. We'll start off in classical antiquity, move our way up through America, and then look at some really innovative designs from the past 50 to 100 years. And then we'll, um, we'll finish up with these invitations to engage. And I think this might be a lot of fun for people who know that they can't necessarily change the building that they're in, but there are different ways to approach it. Okay, so let's get started with our briefest history here, volume one. Okay, when we think about the history of libraries, we're looking at well, we're thinking about the ancient world, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans. And we know that as far back as 1900 BC, there were libraries. And, and, and probably the best known is this artist's rendering of the Library of Alexandria, which was built in 285 BC by the architect Ptolemy. It no longer exists, but we get a sense for just how grand it was. It wasn't filled with books, it was filled with scrolls, and they were carefully protected. Now, the difference between the Library of Alexandria and all the other libraries that existed was that it had a mission and the mission was universal knowledge. So it really stands out from all the libraries, all the other libraries at the time, but libraries proliferated. In ancient Rome, I think they had somewhere around 15 libraries just in Rome itself. So every major city would have had a library or every town would have, and every major city would have had branch libraries. This is an ancient Roman library that dates to um, the first century AD, and it's actually in Turkey. We're only looking at the facade of it here because the rest of the building doesn't exist. I like that you can see the people here because you get a sense of just how grand and impressive it was to walk into this two-story structure here with the really impressive um, openings here, the, the, the columns as well. And then there are all these uh, statues here which uh, represented things like wisdom and valor and that sort of thing. So there is this notion that just walking into the physical space was supposed to be a little bit of a transformative process. And we'll see how that sort of continues on um, here and there throughout the history of, of, of uh, the library architecture. Now we're going to zoom forward into the medieval period. And we are now looking at the Merton Library at Oxford. This is the front of the library itself. And these windows right here correspond to these windows here. So basically this block is that library. And you'll notice that it's nowhere near as um, physically impressive or anywhere near as welcoming as even the, the, uh, the library from Turkey that we were just looking at, that ancient Roman library. There's no big door. You don't really get the sense that you're supposed to be in there. It's actually protected by the fact that it's in a quadrangle here. And so beyond that, if you can make it inside, the, the books that were there were absolute treasures. They weren't meant to be really shared with the world. And I should mention that this is, I think, the oldest continuing academic library in the world. So when you go inside upstairs, books were actually kept in these chests that had not one, not two, but three locks on them. So it's so different from our notion of the modern lending library, but it's a great reminder to us about just how um, how rare and how absolutely precious these texts were. They would have been the most valuable things that people owned. So they were under lock and key. Now we're uh, fast forwarding again. We're heading into the Renaissance and we're taking a look at a library designed by Michelangelo. It was actually finished a few years after his death. This is the Laurentian Library in Florence. It was designed for the very powerful Medici family. And there's just a few things that I want to point out to you. The antechamber into the library space, you can just see that this roof here corresponds to this roof here. This antechamber, this preparation for heading into this library space, this is what's really celebrated when we think about Michelangelo's contributions. Notice how deep these stairs are. Notice that they're even rounded. And then notice how shallow they are. This is a really big staircase. And it's sort of 
almost like inefficient in terms of like rapidly moving up. But Michelangelo was really trying to set the stage because you were moving into a rarefied realm where you were going to touch rare and expensive books. And it was it was like uh, sort of simulating this experience of enlightenment moving into this space here. And you might be thinking, well, where are the books? <laughs> the books were not even in there. These were stalls for people to sit down and study these books. And if you're thinking it looks a lot like church, you're not far off, right? <laughs> it looks exactly like church. And so for the next few centuries, this was pretty much the norm. If we head back to England for a moment, now we're at um, Trinity Hall at Cambridge, and you can see we still have our central aisle here. We have these uh, pew-like benches, but now those stalls where you would have sat and read a book, they now have some shelves integrated into them. I have this shadowy picture over here. It's the same space, but with the figure, I think you can get a sense of just how tall those bookshelves are. And then within a couple more uh, centuries, <laughs> really uh, back at Oxford, they innovate the, the, the shelves that are now ubiquitous at any library, but these still have um, those benches in between them. They are uh, sort of like the great, great grandson of Michelangelo's original design. These are still in place at, at Oxford. So it's so interesting to think about how it sort of slowly morphed into a taller bookshelf and a place to read over time. Now, if we stay in England for just a moment, I want to take you over to Hereford Cathedral, where they have a famous chained library. Are you familiar with chained libraries? These are libraries that are where literally every single text there is under lock and key. You can't take it away from the bookshelf, but you can sit down and read it and then replace it. This is one of the oldest chained libraries in the world. The collection dates to roughly like the 1600s to the 1800s. So there's basically like this rod with the chains going uh, across. And so, like I said, you can still look at the text, but you can't take them anywhere. This is really the antithesis of, of the modern lending library, right? But it, once again, it speaks to the notion that books were such rare and precious objects. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, going back to my page days, I would have loved it if, if the books just stayed right there. That would have, that really would have simplified my work. But before you go feeling bad for, for these books that could never go anywhere, we do have the 17th century notion of a traveling library. So what we're looking at here is a box about this size. Notice that it's decorated to look like um, a neoclassical building, and it's filled with about 50 tiny volumes. And it would have been your essentials, your theology, your philosophy, your classical history, and your poetry. Now, let me just give you a sense in terms of how tiny these books are. They're like, they're like the size of your hand, but this would have been like your Kindle. You could bring it anywhere and you could <laughs> refer to these texts, although I hope you would have had glasses to look at them, right? So in the next century or so, we see the proliferation of books. The uh, publication processes have been updated, and, um, and so libraries are getting ever bigger, ever grander. This is um, the Trinity College Library in Dublin. It dates back to the early 1700s. I think that this is probably the root of our romantic notions of what a library could look like because inside each one of these bays here, they have their own little ladders, right? And we all romanticize about having a, a library with a ladder in it. But you can see just how grand the space is, just how tall each one of those bays are. Once again, in terms of shelving, not ideal. <laughs> but we've got this beautiful rounded arch, uh, a barrel vaulted ceiling here. And this really, I think for so many people, sort of um, becomes the archetype of what a library might look like. In fact, if you're a Star Wars fan, that's what George Lucas was looking at or thinking about when he created um, his Jedi archives. I think this is in Attack of the Clones. Don't ask me how I know that my husband. All right. So if we move into the Rococo, the 1700s, the 1800s, we begin to see a lot of libraries in Spain and Austria that just have this incredible ornate decoration to them. You can see the murals here, these kind of undulating walls. It's an entire, it's a, a, an entire aesthetic experience to walk into a building like this. The books are almost an afterthought. Here's just another view 
of the same space. This is um, a library in Austria that dates to 1776, actually. So uh, when I think of a space like this, there's really nothing rational about it. It's, it's sort of like an emotional experience to walk through something like this. But we're going to end this kind of brief history with the neoclassical period, which is all about rational spaces, rational geometries. And in this case, we're looking at the British Museum Library. It dates to 1855. And it has this huge reading room with a rounded dome above it. It's about 140 feet across. You can see there's no visible um, supports in this dome. They were very consciously trying to reference the Pantheon, the, um, the famous building from ancient Rome that you could fit a perfect sphere inside, essentially. So it's, it's about rational thinking and rational spaces in this case. Uh, the Pantheon is made of concrete, and this is made out of steel and glass and that sort of thing. So this was really um, the center for the literary world in, in the 1800s in, in London. And, and it gives us a good guide for what's going to happen in America too. So let's turn our attention now to libraries in America. We've already taken a look at the Boston Public Library to a certain extent, but uh, for me, it, it always sort of sets the stage for libraries in America because um, it was built on Copley Square, as I mentioned, and just perpendicular to it was uh, the Museum of Fine Arts was originally built there. So we think of these of, of these buildings, these institutions, as having such a similar function, and it would really make sense for them to be closely located to each other. Now, the uh, the Boston Public Library was the first large uh, free municipal library in the United States, the first public library to lend books, and the first to have a branch library and and a children's room. So it wasn't the first library, but it had a lot of other firsts. And we can see here that the architect, um, Charles McKim, really invested in, in um, in sourcing his architecture to make this building look like a Renaissance palace. It's really, um, it, 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 I, I mean, it, it really adds sort of such grace and majesty to the institution itself when you're walking into a building that looks like this. Now, New York wanted to keep right up with Boston. So they hire, um, they, they hire the architectural firm Carrere and Hastings. And in 1902, they erect this giant marble edifice. It was like one of the largest marble buildings in, in um, America. And this is the, the main branch of the New York Public Library. So you'll notice uh, one thing that we'll see again and again are three major portals. Usually they have rounded openings like this, but everything here is meant to recall the classical past or the Renaissance past. We've got these ornate um, Corinthian columns and this projecting porch here. And then of course, you got the, li the lions. In, um, in New York City, they're on the outside over the years, their names have changed, but they are, I think, New York City's favorite mascots, really. I, I think people feel very attached to them. Have you ever been inside the New York Public Library? What a space, right? Okay, so just very quickly, we've got the Rose Reading Room, which is sort of the answer to that beautiful reading room that we have in Boston. Uh, much more cavernous, as you can see. And the system for bringing books to people who are, are doing research in the space is mind boggling. You can see here from this cross section, this is the reading room at the top, and I believe there's seven stories down of book stacks. And I think if they were all lined up end to end, it would be something like 80 miles of books. And so they have almost like um, elevators and little trains systems inside uh, the stacks there so that they can retrieve books as quickly as possible within minutes oftentimes. So this brings us to the Library of Congress um, down in DC, which is a massive institution. It was um, the largest library in the world. And then of course, it now has the largest collection in the world with more than 170 million artifacts in its collection. It was designed in 1897 by John Smithmeyer. And it is uh, an extension of the original Library of Congress, which was created by a donation from Thomas Jefferson. It was just his personal library, and he 
felt like people in Congress should be able to read it. So these days, this is open to the public. The architecture here should look familiar, too. It's all this kind of Beaux-Arts or Renaissance-inspired architecture. In this case, they wanted this building to look like the Paris Opera. So it is, um, it's grand, it's impressive in every way, but we've got our projecting porch here. We've got our, our three portals with the rounded arch um, archway over them. And then there are sculptural busts of, of major authors uh, 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 over the uh, the windows on that second or third level up there. But just above the dome, there is this little um, gold leaf flame, and that is to be the flame of knowledge. That's a motif that we'll get back to again and again. Now, inside the, the Library of Congress, underneath this dome, is this massive circular reading room. Obviously, this isn't the first circular reading room that exists in, Amer in the world. So they're taking a note from the, the British Museum Library. But here we've got these big sort of muscular columns here. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, an impressive space with the bronze sculptures up in the balcony here. But once again, this is where all the research starts. You would go to the, to the librarian at the center desk here, and they would help you retrieve whatever you're looking for. You might remember the scene from All the President's Men, where they are in this very reading room getting going on their, um, uh, on, on their research. So the figure in America who's had the biggest impact on libraries is without a doubt Andrew Carnegie, who we can see here in, um, in this portrait from the National Portrait Gallery from 1905. We don't know who the artist is. Now, Carnegie made his fortune in railroads, oil, and steel. He was the richest man in the world by 1901. But unlike many of the super rich today, he believed that a man who dies rich dies in disgrace. And so he gave away 90% of his fortune about at that time, only about $350 billion. And a huge portion of that went towards funding libraries. Now, before you go thinking that he is some sort of patron saint of libraries, it's a, it's a little bit more convoluted than that. He had this opinion that he would only help people who were industrious enough to already help themselves. So he was really only helping like a small segment of, of the population. But when all was said and done, he, of course, uh, finances the library in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That projecting porch and the three portals underneath it should look familiar by now. They even have uh, um, in stone over the door, free to all people. Now, Andrew Carnegie was so passionate about libraries that um, that for the communities around Pittsburgh that didn't have branch libraries, he even started uh, this little system where these boxes of books would be sent out to these neighborhoods and they would even have volunteers who would go out and read the books to different families and interact with them, question them about what, um, about what they just read and what they understood. So he had a big influence in terms of the way libraries operate even today. Now, um, beyond that, he had a huge impact in terms of the way libraries look. We have um, two libraries here. This one is from Taunton, Mass., and this one is from Rockland, Massachusetts Public Library. And these are both Carnegie libraries. Now, when I said that Carnegie only believed in giving money to the industrious and ambitious, we really have women to thank in general, because after the Civil War, it was women's groups that were going to Carnegie and basically lobbying for um, for, for the construction of a public library in their community. So for the most part, it was women that got these libraries built. Now. Uh, for Carnegie, it didn't matter what they looked like. Uh, they could be Beaux-Arts, they could be um, Baroque, classical, whatever you want. The the exterior would almost, it just didn't really matter to him. But they would almost always be similar in that they had this central access access and stairs leading up reminds you of Michelangelo to a certain degree. You're, you're heading into enlightenment. And sort of like what we saw with that flame of knowledge at um at the Library of Congress, there's almost always a light or a lantern right by the front door, by necessity, of course, but also to remind us of, of this notion of, of, uh, of learning when you head inside. Now, 
Carnegie didn't care about the exterior, but he did um, develop, he and an, a, an assistant developed a pamphlet of what the interior of a library should look like. And all of this came about because of a little bit of penny pinching. The first few libraries that he funded, he felt like they spent way too much money. So they basically came up with a, a couple of prototypes. This is what you can get for a basic grant for a library. And I should mention that when all was said and done, he funded over 2,500 libraries worldwide, more than 1,700 just in America alone. So as it turns out, he prioritized not space for books, but really space for people, meeting rooms, um, spaces for staff. Um, and as it turns out, about 100 years later, these spaces work pretty well because people are coming to libraries to plug in and use the internet and meet with each other. So it's interesting to think about how, how they've evolved over time. Now, I want to just uh, extend this idea in terms of how influential his libraries were because um, because once he would fund a library, oftentimes they would go back to the same architects. You know, you already did this library in this community, come to this next one and fund that or, or build that one. And then even if Carnegie didn't fund the library, you could hire that same architect to essentially build an identical library. So this is my hometown. Wait, which one of it? OK, wait, this is my hometown library. And this is almost an identical structure, which is a Carnegie Museum. This one's in, in uh, Carnegie Library, sorry, in Springfield, Massachusetts. And this is in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's the same architectural firm. It's essentially the same building. So we see that even though he only funded a certain number, his influence goes far beyond. And I think for a lot of libraries, they, they simply didn't know. I mean, if there isn't a, uh, a, a like a block at the base at the foundation of the building that says built by Carnegie. It's hard to know. Did you want to? Did you? I was just counting. Yeah. <laughs> six windows. Right. Uh, just a few yeah. more windows. Right. <laughs> so one last note about Carnegie libraries. One thing that's sort of interesting with uh, hindsight being 2020 is that he was funding libraries in the segregated South. So this is uh, the public library in Savannah, Georgia. It's beautiful building. I love these big ionic co columns here. Central axis, of course. What's interesting is that, I mean, he could have had all the power in the world to say, make this an integrated building. I mean, this is, you know, a temple to democracy here, but he didn't. But if there were groups of black people that he felt were industrious enough, he would build segregated libraries for them. So this is the, one of the black libraries in Savannah, Georgia. Interestingly enough, uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wrote about his childhood and going to that segregated library as, as a child, mm -hmm. which you'd think would have a, a pretty profound influence on someone. Now, one last note in terms of library architecture, museum architecture, how all of this functions in our society today, I think it's important for all of us here to think about the fact that this kind of architecture, whether it's it's so grand or maybe a little bit more understated, isn't necessarily welcoming to the public at all. It, I mean, whenever I look at buildings like this, I think of courthouses, which disempower so many people. I This building in particular looks like a, a police station to me. So it's interesting to think that what we, what I think many people think of as being grand and, um, you know, the, the quintessential palace for the people doesn't necessarily work for huge sections of the population. So with our, with our uh, remaining time in this section, I'd like to show you some different approaches to building libraries that are, are really sort of outside of the box. So this is when things get fun. As we um, turn our attention to the sort of the, the first first part of, of the 20th century, you have um, the Brooklyn Central Library here, here. And this is from 1941. And this is more like an Art Deco style. You'll notice there's like an Egyptian motif around this door here. These are architects that are not necessarily going to be impressed upon in terms of that uh, Carnegie model. So we've got a, a pretty impressive main portal here, but notice how the, the rest of the building sort of looks like it's opening up almost as though it's, it's functioning like a book itself. Now, 
if you if you know me, you might know that I am obsessed with this rare library book at Yale. This is um, the Beinecke Rare Library, Rare Book Library. It's from 1963. It was designed by the architecture firm Skidmore, Owing, and Merrill. And oftentimes we see that a lot of the boldest steps in terms of library design in the 20th century really come from academic institutions that could afford to buy to. Um, to uh, commission really sort of preeminent architects. So what's so fantastic about this rare book library is how it's designed to really protect these rare artifacts from sunlight. So the only um, glass is at this kind of foundational level here. And then we have very, very thin cut marble uh, panels for the rest of the building. And you might think, oh God, that must be oppressive inside. I'll show you inside in just a moment, but I do want to note just the fact just the proportions of this building were designed to, to refer to um, the, the general proportions for older texts, too. So there's this real thoughtfulness, even though it's a strikingly modern edifice. When you go inside, those thin marble panels in the right light just light up, and it is otherworldly. It's one of the most glorious spaces I've ever been in. So there's that light from the the uh, from the, like the foundation level of the building. And then all of those rear books are kept in these glass stacks over here. It's quite an experience. Now we have a great example locally of, of a modern, a great modern architect who designed a library. And that's of course the one at Phillips Exeter Academy designed by Louis Kahn in 1971. Now, I'm sure, what's that? Well, I thought it was Kane who designed it. Uh, oh, it was actually Louis Kahn. Yeah. So, um, so I'm sure many of you have heard the story of how it wasn't supposed to be more than four stories high because of building codes in Exeter and how he got around that. Oh, I'll show you that. Okay, so the committee that hired Louis Kahn to do this, they already had a sense for his approach to architecture, which is sort of this monumental, almost monolithic buildings that have these regular geometric cutouts. So they, they thought, okay, well, let's use, Let's use some some brick because that will sort of fall in line with the rest of the campus, which is sort of Georgian architecture, brick, brick Georgian architecture. And let's keep it in scale with these other buildings, no more than four stories tall. And you sort of look at it and you're like, OK, that's about four stories tall, right? <laughs> it's nine stories tall. But he does some really wonderful things inside. He builds these gorgeous um, uh, study carols here. And he builds into the wall these uh, these sliders, almost like airplane windows, so you can modulate the light uh, where you're studying. And you can see that those the, the, a big pane of glass like this one corresponds to what we see over here. The every single story of this library has a mezzanine story for housing more books. And all of those books, those stacks are set back from the natural light to protect them. When you go inside, there's this central court inside the, the building itself. And even though we've got that monumentality to this building with so much uh, uh, concrete here too, we can see Louis Kahn, who just loves some good, simple architecture, has cut out these grand circles here so you can peer into all of the stacks uh, wherever you are. And then you've got this massive X across the top here. He called them his donuts, but they are just really sort of exquisite to, to experience them in real life. Now, we're going to move into the 21st century, and we're going to see some of the good and the bad and the ugly here. So I'm always interested to hear, especially what librarians think when they see some of these buildings. This is um, Salt Lake City's main library, designed by Maushi Safdi in 2003. And it, it's such a, an architectural icon that it's become one of the top tourist destinations in Salt Lake City. So when you plan your next trip there, make sure you put this on your list because one of the things that you can do is walk up this like crescent moon staircase and go to the roof and you get this unbelievable view of Salt Lake City. So you have the, the this staircase here that leads you up to that rooftop garden. Now the rest of the library here, I mean, Honestly, it doesn't. It, there's not much to write home about. It looks like a shopping mall. There's a lot of um, of glass there, and you go inside, and that's actually exactly what the architect delivered. There's a library on one side, but there's shops on the other side. It's really about integrating this library into 
everyday life of the people of Salt Lake City. So it's become a new public square here using materials that are very familiar to people. There's nothing intimidating about going into a shopping mall, right? So I want to turn your attention to what I think is another really amazing example of, of recent library architecture. This is the Central Library at Calgary um, in Alberta, Canada. This is from 2008, and the architectural firm is called Snoheda. Uh, just the this entryway here is designed to refer to a, a familiar cloud formation there. It's called a chinhook cloud. And you can see that the building itself is glass, well, it's, it's a solid building, but it sort of fades away into glass and little pieces are kind of missing here. And they kind of look like the pages of books and then those books sort of linked together to look like buildings and houses. I, I mean, how symbolic, it's really incredible. And this library actually sits in a specific part of town, which is a, 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 a transportation hub. So all of these people are coming and going, but it's also sitting at a place in town, which had sort of felt like a wound, kind of separating East and West. And now it's like this great unifier. Now, the, um, this isn't, the first time a library has ever been designed this way, but you can see that the interior space is just glorious with all this wood here. But the concept was it's four stories, make everything fun on the first floor. And then by the time you get up to the fourth floor, it's all about um, research and special collections. So the stairs over here sort of double as a gathering space and as a public performance space. It's really absolutely lovely inside. Now, has anybody here ever been to the Seattle Public Library? Yeah, it, good, bad, what'd you think? It was really neat. OK, so I'm going to share some of the good and some of the bad about the Seattle Public Library, because obviously it's a really striking building here. This was done in 2004. It's 11 stories tall. And you can see from as we sort of move around it, it looks different from every single perspective here. And it's been cut up into really um, interesting sections as well. Now, when it was first opened, uh, the architectural world went crazy over it. They said that this is like one of the greatest buildings of the 21st century and, um, and, and how innovative it was. Now I can point out to you one of the problems already. There isn't, there aren't a lot of ways to access this building from the street. So you actually see huge long lines here. It's not like there's doors all around this building. It, um, the, the, dramatically increased foot traffic and spending in this part of town with the with the construction of this library. But in the end, uh, that, that most essential function of actually bringing people in was a little bit challenging. And now here's what I see challenging as a public speaker, just in this space alone. We're looking at two perspectives of the same space. Here's that yellow escalator. Here it is over here. You can see there's some stacks over here meeting spaces. It looks like there was a cafe there at one point, but now there's like a shop. But look at this, there's like auditorium seating over here and it's all open to the public. If we were in Seattle right now, we'd probably be hearing people putting in a latte order, right? You know, so there's like competing noise here, which to me, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. Now we're going to shift gears. Oh, and I should say that the public, well, the architectural world just completely turned on this building after just a few years. They um, they referred to it as as being, Oh God, uh, I have all these quotes about it, but basically they hated the way it worked. <laughs> and so, so people actually sort of like swallowed their words, ate their words just a couple of years later upon seeing how it actually worked for people. Now, there are some buildings that are never popular. So I'm going to show you a couple of, of, of uh, buildings that were considered to be kind of flops from the get-go. This is a library in Edmonton, Alberta. It was a much talked about remodel. The concept was that they were essentially going to take the exterior walls off of the library so that it could be the same structure in the same place. They liked the location and they'd essentially put a new exterior on here. Now people saw this and they, this is the finish. This is the after uh, look here. And they compared it to a battleship. They compared it to a dumpster. I absolutely love this tweet that, you know, here's the dating profile picture versus the dude who's sitting across the table from you. So there's this sense of profound disappointment. 
department with what they got there. Um, so it's unfortunate that you know a, a, a library could invest so much time and energy into a redo and it just kind of falls flat. Incidentally, here's the inside of it. Really looks like a 1990s cruise ship to me. The, like there's nothing that's really making my heart sing. Now, this is a library. This is a, a library in Germany on a like a technical college campus. And I think that there's a lot of really promising things when you look at the exterior of it. I love that it sort of looks like an, ame an amoeba here. We don't have any corners, which is probably not good for housing anything in, in a logical way, but it also looks a little fortress-like. We do have this idea of accessibility being a problem, but it's essentially all glass and there's like a scrim around the building. With, um, with not a specific uh, form of writing, but all of these glyphs. So as you're approaching it in daylight, you get the sense that it's all about writing and information. Incidentally, this is a library that doesn't call itself a library. They call it an information communications and media center, even though it's a library. So that sort of gets into a whole other uh, you know, strain of thinking about, is the term library somehow antiquated? Now you go inside and you can see that the colors are just garish. They chose fuchsia and lime green for wayfinding purposes, but I can tell you every single student that goes to this, <laughs> this particular institution has found it to be really distracting and a space that you can't really get comfortable in. Now, this next library that I wanted to show you was never built. <laughs> I think it's still being considered for the absolutely gorgeous, picturesque location of the city of Prague. Now they hadn't, they they haven't had a new major building built since the 1800s. They had an international competition for architects to submit ideas for what their new public library could look like, and. This was the winner. This was actually the unanimous choice. And you can imagine how many people are pushing back against this. Um, so let me let me wrap up with one last building here that has been built and um, whose who's, uh, praises have been sung extensively. This is Hunter's Point Library in Queens. The architect is Stephen Hall. Um, from uh, to, and and the building dates to 2019. Now this was a 20 to 15 year process to build this library, uh, which I think is probably like you know stepping on the brakes for all of you who are imagining renovations. The price tag was 41 million dollars, but it seemed like everybody was happy at least at the beginning. The New York Times said the library is among the finest and most uplifting public buildings New York has produced so far this century. They continued on it, it's, um, and heralded it as a stunning architectural model, marvel. You can see it's got a great view of the city. And then looking back across the river from the city, you can see it really stands out. And they called it a beacon of learning, literacy, and culture. Did anyone here ever hear what went wrong with this library? <laughs> They had sections of the library that were completely inaccessible to anybody with mobility issues. Just like uh, several stack, stacks of books here you couldn't get to. And even in the children's room, there was like the scenic vista up here. Once again, you could only access it with stairs. And so it's pretty amazing that that much time and that much money went into building what could have been like the world's greatest library. And, um, and they fall short on, on serving their public. So you know that there were probably a lot of librarians missing from those planning meetings, right? <laughs> like, how, how are we going to get people to those books? So there is a class action lawsuit against the city because of this library. So we'll wrap up with our last few minutes in terms of how, um, how, libra how libraries and librarians have kind of overcome um, some of the challenges of, of their buildings. And one of the first ways they've done that is by changing the role of librarian uh, to begin with. So, you know, in I, I think if, if we had a, a, a position description for a librarian 20 years ago, it probably looks very different today. And, and these days we even talk about concierge librarians that you would sit down with and potentially they could talk to you about, you know, how you could, 
you know, download audiobooks or what would be the best way for you to access information. But this is somebody who is really helping you through your um, your reading journey, whether it's research or or just for pleasure. So along with that, we have this this uh, there's nothing new about a mobile library, but we do have uh, the, the continuation of the extension of the library and the librarian out beyond the library walls. And I think book bikes in particular, I somehow I find that much more appealing than a, than a bookmobile. So here are a couple of great examples of that. And then of course we have um, we have this notion that librarians are always trying to invite readers uh, to to try out new texts in 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 increasingly interesting ways, whether it's a blind date or never judge a book by its movie or these books were banned, find out why. This one is so simple, but I love it dying for a, a murder mystery and they just have the, the chalk outline on the floor. <laughs> now, beyond the programming, there are, of course, some opportunities in, in some communities to build these structures. In this case, this is just the wall to the parking garage that um, that really call out to the public what the function of the building is and invite the public to think about reading in new and imaginative ways, to literally imagine themselves inhabiting a book, which is what we want everybody to do. So this is the Community Bookshelf, once again, from Kansas City. You can see just how extensive this is. Here are a few more of those titles. And here's another great detail. As you walk up the steps to that garage, you can see that the steps themselves are, are books again. And, you know, I. Um, I have a lot of friends that are very interested in like theme parks and immersive experiences, and this would just draw them right in. It would make them salivate. And even inside the library, there are spaces that make you feel like, once again, you are inhabiting the book, you're inhabiting the story. So there's plenty of other libraries over the years that have adopted sort of a similar motif. This is the Duluth Library that has this entryway here that has the book spines. The rest of it sort of looks like it's blasting off into outer space, but um, but it's 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 a nice it's a nice motif here. And even at the Philadelphia um, Airport. There is a branch of the Philadelphia Public Library. Once again, they're using the book spines to, to um, reel people in. But it's this notion that you can register for a library card there. You can access the Wi-Fi. You can even borrow a book, which I think is such a smart way to engage with people who are desperate for some reading material. <laughs> now, I also want to um, share with you a couple of pieces of architecture and other design that have um, that were that have been intended to engage people with the very notion of visiting a library this one for better or for worse is called sitting on history from 1995 it's at the british library in london and the the sculptor bill woodrow said uh referring to this kind of chained up ball and chain uh, along with the book, refers to the book as the captor of information from which we cannot escape. I don't know how, how positive that is, but the first thing I thought of when I saw it was, you know, the memory of those chained <laughs> libraries. Um, some libraries like the, um, the Denver Public Library designed by Michael Graves, they do really interesting things inside the building. For, uh, for instance, this is sort of the, the main concourse when you walk in and you can walk over to this little slot and you insert your books there. And it's not like they just fall into a, 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 a you know, some sort of cart and, and they disappear. Instead, it's like watching, um, it's like watching an old fashioned factory. You see them go up a, 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 a what a, a, a conveyor belt, exactly. And you see it go through sort of all the motions and, and all the hands that would touch it. So there's like a little bit of thrill in terms of returning your book. And certainly, let me tell you, children would be really enthousi enthusiastic about returning their books. And this is um, a good segue to thinking about children and books in general, because I think it was in 19, around the 1990s that... Um, that the Institute of Museums and Library Sciences came under one heading. So that really unified museums and libraries. And so we see the children's rooms in libraries looking increasingly more so like children's museums. They're interactive spaces, whether they're woodland settings or dinosaurs or medieval or just um, a, sort of like a hands-on bookmobile here. Even at um, the Chapel Hill Library, the, their public library down in um, 
in Chapel Hill, we have this series of sculptures. We have a turtle, a rabbit, a snake, and a frog. And this is where they do a lot of the programming for kids because those are the subjects of so many kids' uh, books. They've become like mascots to the community, much in the same way that the lions originally did. So we, don't, we no longer really need the lions. They're not protecting anything. Why not make it a little bit more fun? I'm sure a few of you have seen book benches along the ways. We see these these sorts of things all over the world. These are in Bulgaria. Um, this is in Prague. This is a book tower, uh, which is really just created for photo ops so that you can stick your head in, take a picture like this, and then post it on social media. And then, of course, I'm sure all of us have, have seen some sort of version of, um, of the staircase of knowledge, whether it's, it's great uh, books of the past or favorite children's authors over here. This is from Lebanon. This is from um, Minnesota. Now, I'd also like to share with you this one piece of public sculpture to kind of wrap up this section. This is called Architectural Fragment, and it is on a public sidewalk in Melbourne, Australia. And what we're seeing here, of course, is just uh, the, the sort of the, the the last gasp of a library that is sinking into quicksand or lava or water, but it's disappearing. And we're seeing it just before it falls out of view. And there's some sort of sense here of like, there's a respectable edifice here, but it's the ed edifice of what is now a bygone era. So what is the future? I'm not gonna say that the future is little libraries, but we are going to end with little libraries very quickly um, because there is so much related here to what we talked about already. Uh, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the nonprofit organization. It's based out of Wisconsin. And the concept here is that you, join the organization, you get on their map, and then you put a little library that looks something like this, um, either on your property or somewhere close by. This to me reminds me so much of Andrew Carnegie's original idea with those book boxes that would go out to the neighborhoods. And of course, you know, during the pandemic, these little libraries became lifelines to people. They became like pantries. It was a place to get toilet paper. <laughs> And one of the great things about the Little Library organization is that they encourage as much creativity as possible in the design of your libraries. Now, I'm sure most of us don't think that we have anything in common with, uh, with modern architects, but apparently we do. People get really creative with these designs. Here's just a few more. They're just wild, aren't they? They're really fun. And, and of course, they are invitations to engage in every way. But interestingly, uh, the Little Library Organization, if you don't know where to start, sort of like Andrew Carnegie, they have plans for you. This is, this is how you get started with your little library. This is how you build it. So um, perfectly on time right now, we are going to conclude with just a couple of big ideas here. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the, the fundamental role a, a library has in terms of sharing knowledge and making connections. Now, architecturally, significant buildings are, sorry, I should say, historically, architecturally significant buildings have been designed to reflect that sacred role that libraries have in civic life. And that is, in so many ways, a similar role that art museums have in civic life. Today, we've looked at uh, important library buildings that have emphasized their collections and the various ways you can protect them. We've looked at libraries that exalt art and the richness of display of, of the library's collections. We have looked at buildings that have showcased design, both traditional and innovative. And we have looked at libraries that prioritize interaction and hands-on learning. Finally, we've considered buildings that have been designed to bring people together and to build community. And really, isn't that what it's all about? So what we, I think what the biggest takeaway really is that there is no one right way to build a library and that architects and individuals are going to constantly find new solutions. So we should hope to see many more reinventions in the years to come. So I will end it there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about library architecture. <clears throat> and
anything you want to go back to. No, but I want to ask you, what's your favorite library? Ooh, what's my favorite library? I don't know, but I will tell you that after doing this program, I want to duck into every single library I see, no matter how big it is or small, how, you know, how old it is, how new it is. It's like, you, you want to go see it. And after I, I finished a Zoom once and somebody was like, I feel like I need to go see every Carnegie library there is. And you can definitely easily find that list. I mean, there's not a lot of variation there, but <laughs> yes. Is, do you know offhand, is Phillips Exeter Library open to the public or is it just for the uh... I sort of have a dream of starting a tour program for that library, though. They are missing that. Yeah. 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 Um, arrange with the library and have a tour. You can. Oh, you can? Okay. You can arrange for a tour. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be really cool okay, just because we've got Frank Lloyd Wright in Manchester and we've got Louis Kahn in, in Exeter. It would be really cool to do yeah. some sort of modern architecture tour yeah. in, in New Hampshire someday. Is the one in, I've never been to the one in Manchester. Is it still the same, or they put on an addition? It's still the same. Still the same. Yeah, there's. I they have a a, a better elevator now. Really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was an addition, but yeah. it's still the same. Yeah. Yes. You remember from the feeling with some of the architectural buildings that yeah. you've been showing us that the architects are thinking more of displaying their architectural skill than they are of the library. So, so well stated, like the notion that that some of these are like ego projects, right? And you certainly see that in the museum world as well. Um, so it and, and I think museums in particular are always trying to hire big name architects that are going to show off a little bit. And I think you've seen that especially ever since the rise of like Frank Gehry and like deconstructivist architecture. Um, so now it's, you know, libraries are in the race for that too. And it certainly gets them noticed, but I mean, their function is so specific to serve the, the immediate community that, that you wouldn't think that a grand ego project is really the way to go. But sometimes it works, right? <laughs> sometimes it's nice architecturally, yeah. but it's not nice as a library. Right. Nobody wants that blob from Prague. <laughs> yes. The library in Queens that has that court access. Yes. So, like, how did that open without access for the disabled? Like, yeah. why couldn't they, how come they can't fix that? Like, put elevators in or, I mean, it wouldn't be $41 million. Why, <laughs> why is that still open without access to the disabled? It, well, believe it or not, it's really just this one section here that was like the biggest problem. And it's really it's like it's it's basically like three stacks of books. And so the library said, well, you know, if you need something there, we'll just send a librarian for you. If You you know, I mean, they, they were just trying to do workarounds for it. But it's pretty remarkable that that got built that way, you know, and I I mean, this is like the first year in almost a decade I've been able to walk into a library without a stroller. And so just thinking about like walking into a library and thinking like, where do you go? <laughs> How am I going to get up there is, is pretty astonishing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that it got by like all of these levels of- was able to open. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yes. Do you know who wrote that rave review about it? It was the New York Times. Yeah, New York Times. Isn't that pretty amazing? I was just curious if it was Michael Carolyn? Oh, I don't know. I believe he's an architect who does a lot of that sort of stuff. And, yeah. I'm not, if I that's the case, I've lost my faith in him. Um, I don't have his name in here. How old is that library? Yeah, is that fairly new? That, yeah, it opened in 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is that the one that's in the horse? horse. <laughs> I don't yeah. say that. Uh, sure. This is Stephen Hole. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought I had read more sort of problems with it. I, I, I think like it was missing a lot of hand railings or something. I mean, it was just, it was like one of these things where it was like in terms of public use, it was just a nightmare. <laughs> Pretty amazing that it gets built. Yes. Can you go forward to the picture of the children's library? The, oh, this part? Or no, all of those? The, like the ones with the, the round mm -hmm. part? Sure because it is very reminiscent, that one, yeah. it's very reminiscent of the entrance into Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, it makes a connection between museums, libraries, and hospitals. Yeah, yeah.
and that we have we have a good understanding in terms of how to engage children and we know that you know part of learning is inhabiting these spaces and having like these interactive opportunities so that's that's interesting to think that even the hospitals have taken a note from children's libraries that's fascinating i mean i will tell you as a mom of 3 I look at like every library in the region in terms of what their programming looks like. I know which ones have the best spaces so that I can bring my kids in and, they, and there's just something hands on for them to use. And I know that there's a lot of moms like that. If we had something like this, we might just move right in. <laughs> yeah. My other question is, in your spare time, have you thought about or have you already written a book about this? Because it would be fabulous. Ooh. Well, you're very nice to say that. I think there's some good books out there, but I think maybe my perspective in terms of connecting it to art museums might be new. That's, thank you. That's that's a, a nice suggestion, and I will think about it all the way home. Yeah. <laughs> you already have a lot of the, yeah. the pictures and the examples, and you already know so much about the individual places that, I mean, I would say it would be a snap because no, no book ever is, but yeah. it would be fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, um, there's some big ideas there. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it.